Thank you all for the honor of inviting me to be a speaker at your first of what may be uh, an annual major conference here in Ireland on counseling and psychotherapy. I had a uh, wonderful introduction to Ireland again, my second time here, uh, coming back from the airport with a lovely taxi driver named uh, Paul, who I understand is related to uh, um, <coughs> one of your members here. And uh, we were talking and, uh, he, and I was saying that, you know, I've always wanted to read James Joyce's Ulysses and uh, maybe this would be an opportunity for me. And uh, he was going to give me his card with a phone number so I could call him on, for a return ride to the airport. And uh, he disappeared and I thought, well, he, he must have forgotten. Uh, but <clears throat> Nisha gave me on his behalf, uh, about an hour later, came back and said, Paul asked me to give you this, and it was a copy of Ulysses with his name and a phone number on it. So I, I thought, what, what better introduction to, what, what, what better welcome or friendly reception could I have had uh, in arriving in Ireland than that? But it's been repeated so many times since then, so I thank you for your gracious invitation, and I hope in the next hour to uh, <clears throat> reciprocate with... Uh, what I think will be uh, an inspiring story about a man who is in many ways one of, one of the fathers of the uh, counseling and psychotherapy profession. The theme of your conference is improving therapeutic relationships and Carl Rogers, arguably above all, gave us insights about the therapeutic relationship that still serve as the foundation for our profession. And I was privileged uh, 40 years ago to write the first full biography of Carl Rogers, uh, I called it On Becoming Carl Rogers, appropriately, and he was still alive. I got to know him during that time quite well and uh, he was very helpful in the writing of, of the biography. But he lived for another 10 years after this was published, and I always knew, and he always knew, that I was going to write another edition after his death. So when he did die in 1985, um, 87, excuse me, at the age of 85, um, I began gathering information and, and did so over the next 15 years. Uh, I had some other responsibilities during that time, so it took a while. But <clears throat> eventually in 2007, published uh, a new book called The Life and Work of Carl Rogers. I didn't think that I was going to learn a whole lot more about Rogers in writing the second biography than I had learned while writing the first biography. I had followed his career, I thought, um, and I, it, it was a chore that I was looking forward to, but I, not because I thought I was going to learn a lot more about my subject. But in fact, I learned a great, there were a great number of surprises that awaited me as I began to do research on Roger's life and work. Um, in part, that was because Rogers, as public as he was in many ways, was a very private person and kept a lot close to the best. He, 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 there were a lot of parts of his life he didn't share. Um, so by in, interviewing colleagues and family who knew him over the last 15 years, I began to learn a lot more. Also because he had set aside his private diaries and papers in a university library which were not to be seen for another 50 years after his death. But he wrote a letter giving me authorization to see those diaries and private letters and papers that were quite a revelation. In addition, there was a, there was a man named David Cohn from the UK who wrote a rather scurrilous uh, biography of Rogers. Um, charging him with all sorts of things and presenting information out of context that presented Rogers in a much less favorable light than, than most people who knew him and that I had always seen him in. But I had to 
I had to figure out you now what of what Cohn was saying was true and what was just sensationalism trying to get attention. And in, in so, so doing, I had to dig deeper. Uh, and that turned out to be a good thing, to, to be forced to try to find out what was really happening that, that I had not known about. And finally, 25 years later, I, I had a bit more historical perspective and I hopefully a little bit more maturity myself, a little bit more distance from the subject that I was able to reevaluate what I had known about Rogers and what I was newly learning about Rogers. So the result was a book uh, that The Life and Work of Carl Rogers that was quite different than the earlier edition. And what I would like to do for the rest of my uh, speak, speech today is share with you about three or four of the surprises that I had in the professional area and another th three surprises about Carl Rogers' personal life. And, and then I'd like to reflect on these surprises and what, what meaning did they have for me and possibly for us. So first, in terms of some of the th learnings I had about Carl Rogers and his work. Well, I knew how Carl Rogers was important historically in the United States and in the profession. I think we all know his seminal contributions about the therapeutic relationship, the importance of the core conditions of empathy and unconditional positive regard and congruence and how those qualities in therapists of any school, whether one is uh, person-centered, cognitive behavioral, existential, you name it, dozens and scores of different therapeutic approaches, still the importance of the professional establishing that therapeutic relationship as the foundation at least for all successful psychotherapy and counseling but I, this was a historical contribution. As far as Roger's popularity in the United States, it seemed to be confined mostly to uh, theory courses in counseling, uh, lip service paid to Rogers, but he's, he was not a figure and the person-centered approach, while again taught in theory courses, you get your week on the person-centered approach, you get your week on or two on cognitive uh, behavioral therapy and on uh, perhaps some of the new approaches to therapy. But uh, there was not a live person-centered movement in the United States. And I thought, mistakenly, because Americans tend to be kind of provincial, I thought that was probably true around the rest of the world as well. Well, one of the great surprises I had was to find that throughout the world, the person-centered approach to counseling and psychotherapy is much more alive and well than I had realized. Throughout Europe, there are numerous organizations in most countries of Europe that support person-centered, client-centered therapy with robust research programs, training programs, certification programs for counselors in the person-centered approach, organizations, some of which number in the thousands, in other countries in the hundreds. Uh, compared to the US, there's a, the uh, Association for the Development uh, of the Person-Centered Approach that has maybe two or 300 members. Uh, throughout Europe, it's uh, so much more robust. And in South America, and in Asia, uh, many parts of the world have a, the, for them, Carl Rogers and the person-centered approach is much more than of historical interest, but a, an important part of professional practice right out in the forefront. So that was the first uh, great surprise I had. Uh, another of the surprises was to <coughs> learn about Roger's last 10 years turned out to be among the most productive, prolific, and important years of his professional career, which spanned some 60 years. 
because in the last 10 or 15 years of Roger's life, he devoted himself to applying the person-centered approach to the area of, inter of peacekeeping, conflict resolution, cross-cultural and cross-cultural communication. We, we know how, uh, for those who have followed some of Roger's career, how over the course of his life he continued to expand the applications of the person-centered approach. Start out in counseling, the value of that therapeutic relationship in one-on-one -on -one counseling and therapeutic relationships. Then he started applying it more seriously to education and taught and wrote about how teachers or what he called facilitators of learning could use those same three core conditions to foster personal growth and intellectual growth in their students by trusting one's students, by empathizing and understanding them by freeing them to set their own goals and directions, by being a real, genuine individual and not just the facade of a, of a teacher and an authority figure, how these conditions of learning unleash the same kind of creativity, independence, and, and growth in students as they did in clients. And there was a great deal of research, both in, uh, in the US and in uh, Germany, in particular, Reinhold Tausch's work, uh, and others demonstrated how the core conditions for teachers definitely affected academic growth <coughs> in students. And then Rogers went on to expand the, the, his theories uh, or apply his theories to marriage relationships in, uh, in a book on marriage and its alternatives, on leadership, along with Thomas Gordon, how leaders, by again trusting the, the people that they managed and were responsible for supervising, by empathizing with them, by freeing them to set some of their, their own goals and directions and work toward them, by being real with them, uh, unleashed in employees and in organizations the same kind of creativity and dynamism and uh, healing and growth for organizations as it does for individuals. So Rogers kept on expanding the applications of the person-centered approach and he expanded it into person-centered communities where in large groups for hundreds, even uh, seven, eight hundred people uh, in which the facilitators essentially uh, uh, went beyond the small encounter group, but used the same kind of core conditions to support and empathize with the, uh, and give freedom of, of direction and choice to large audiences, how it would build over time with a lot of frustration, with a lot of strurum and drang, with a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of strong feelings unleashed, would eventually, in week or two, two week experiences create a sense of closeness and democracy and participation among large groups of people. Uh, this was the course of Roger's career and in the last 10 years he expanded it to intergroup conflict resolution because in these large community experiences that he was offering, he and his colleagues were offering, there were people from different backgrounds came together uh, Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, he, he did one notable group uh, with uh, Catholics and Protestants from Ireland. Um, he did, uh, he worked with uh, health care providers and, and health care recipients in the U.S. Uh, worked with, uh, you know, m with Marxists and, uh, and conservatives in one notable experiment, he and his group got funding to bring together 40 protagonists in the war in, Nicar in Nicaragua. This was a time in the 1980s, 1970s and 80s, when uh, Central America was erupting in conflict that <clears throat> threatened to spill over and bring in the United States and, and Russia, the Cold War powers in which the Sandinistas and the Contras in Nicaragua were f fighting one another. And 
it was a very serious world situation, and Rogers and his colleagues brought together in Switzerland representatives of the different sides, as well as other people from around the world who had an interest in the conflict, including informal representatives of President Nixon's administration in Washington, as well as some of the revolutionaries who couldn't officially say they were because it was illegal, but it was known that they represented the Sandinistas and the Contra government supporters, and uh, as well as uh, people like uh, former presidents of, of Costa Rica and the president of the International uh, University of Peace in Costa Rica, and they brought them together in a, in, uh, in a room, in a hotel, uh, in Switzerland, far away from the conflict and away from the eyes of reporters. And for four days, Rogers and his colleagues, Rogers at this time being uh, about 80 years old, uh, 80, 82, I think, um, <clears throat> sat with them, listened, expressed their hopes for genuine communication, and gradually saw people who started out being antagonistic to one another slowly start to listen to one another. Um, and sometimes this happened during the sessions, sometimes outside the sessions. But to give you an idea of the power of it, at one point, the, um, <coughs> the representative of the Nixon administration said to one of the Sandinistas, I know the solution to, said this publicly rather, said in the whole group, I know this, this simp, the solution to the war in Nicaragua is very simple. Just drop a bomb on Managua. That, that's the, that was the capital of, of Nicaragua. So that went uncommented on at the time, but over a meal the next day, one of the representatives of the Sandinistas said, you know, I'm thinking of that comment you made, just drop a bomb on Nicaragua. And I want you to see this. And he took out of his, his wallet out and showed him a picture of his family and his children. And he said, if you were to do that, you would be, you would be killing my children here. And the Nixon representative said, well, I, I didn't really mean that exactly like it sounded. And they started to talk. And throughout the conference, they continued to talk and to listen a little bit more to the point where when it was over, they were making plans to have their children visit one another. As, as the teenage, teenage children have exchanged visits with one another. I don't think that, that, that visits actually took place, but they had gotten to the point where they now regarded one another as human beings. They could empathize, they could understand. There were no simple solutions to the problem. But interestingly, after the conference, there continued to be dialogue. And within two years, the peace agreement had been signed, ending the war in, in Nicaragua and, and essentially in Central America. And Carl Rogers was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, after, this was the year he died. He received the nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts not only in Nicaragua, but demonstrating around the world the power of understanding, of empathy, to bring about understanding between people who are normally antagonistic to one another. And when, when as part of gathering the, the, uh, the, the materials for the nomination, uh, the former president of Costa Rica, uh, Rodrigo Caruso, Carrazo wrote, and Oscar Arias, both wrote, two former presidents, wrote letters on behalf of Roger's support and credited him with helping bring about the peace process in Central America. And when I read that, I thought, well, they're being very generous. And in fact, Oscar Arias did win the peace prize for his role in bringing about peace in Central America. Um, I thought, well, they're being a little generous to him in crediting him with br helping bring that about. But the more I thought about it, and the more I learned about it, what Arias and Carrasso were saying was that negotiations had broken down. We had tried everything in terms of normal diplomacy, and nothing was working. 
It was only when Rogers and his colleagues brought us together again and we began to talk to one another and listen to one another in a different way that we were able to get enough trust. We didn't solve the problems at the Rogers conference, but we had enough trust to start talking again, and that did lead within a year or two to the steps that brought about peace in Central America. And so Rogers, although he, he did not win the Nobel Peace Prize, he could not have, when, if you died, uh, you couldn't receive it pos posthumously, but, um, and, and Arias did win it for the same, for the same effort. Um, it's not surprising that Rogers was nominated and that his picture, Carrasso said, at the University of Peace in Central America, Rog Rogers' picture is hanging in the central atrium as, as he, is, he is our master, is the way that, uh, uh, that Carrasso phrased it. So to, to realize that, and many people in the psychology profession are not aware of that last 10, 15 years in Rogers' life where he demonstrated that what we do as therapists and counselors in a microcosm of our own offices or small groups has powerful applications that the world can benefit from, that our communities in conflict, our cities, our countries, can, and the world can benefit from. So this was, a, this was a powerful learning for me in delving deeper into Roger's life and work. Another thing that I, I was surprised to learn about was the extent of research that continued to be done on the person-centered approach. Um, I had been aware of some of it, but in the US, uh, there, there, there are not robust research programs on uh, almost anything but, but cognitive uh, psychology, cognitive therapy. And, but the more I learned about what was going on around the world, the more I began to realize how again and again, it has sort of happened over several generations, Roger's own initial research, Roger's later research, the group of people who came after him, and then 30 years later, even more research on the importance of the therapeutic relationship for outcomes in counseling and psychotherapy. And what has been discovered again and again, in study after study, is that it is not so much the techniques or the theories of the different approaches that we may employ in our own counseling and therapy practices, but it's the therapeutic relationship, the therapeutic alliance, the therapeutic bond, therapeutic contract. People sometimes describe it differently, but essentially they're saying it's the relationship between two human beings or between the leader, uh, the, the, the uh, therapist and the group that is most effective in bringing about change and, and counseling and psychotherapy. And this has sometimes been demonstrated in very powerful studies. Like there was a, there was a, a study done by Nolan and Bloxama in several large, uh, this is in the US, in several large university counseling and, and uh, hospitals in which they were working with um, people with uh, moderate to, to, to serious uh, psychological stresses and illnesses and they followed, the, and they were comparing several different approaches to, to therapy and one of the things they did was they passed out a questionnaire to the uh, patients that they filled out after every session and the questionnaire basically was a very simple one and it said, um, do you feel your therapist understands you? And uh, they just they collected this enormous amount of information across dozens of different therapists of different orientations. And what they found was that the single greatest predictor of a successful outcome in psychotherapy is whether during the second session, it was true in other sessions also, but particularly by the second session, those 
clients who were saying, my patient, my, my counselor understands me, were most successful, far more successful in their outcomes than those who did not feel understood by their counselor or therapist. And it was, in, and this was mostly, although they, it was somewhat eclectic, it was mostly cognitive therapists who were the therapists in this study. And the people who ran the study and ran the program in the hospital that was doing the research were so impressed by the results that afterwards they instituted a protocol in the hospital that in all of their therapeutic work, um, they would give the clients, the, the patients, a questionnaire like that every, after every session and immediately give the feedback to the counselor so that if the counselor learned that he did not, she did not feel understood by his or her counselor, the counselor could immediately take steps to try to repair the therapeutic relationship. And this has been shown time and again that it's not, the, 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 in studies that demonstrated different, uh, that utilized different therapeutic approaches, they found that it wasn't the approach that made the difference, but it was the degree to which the counselors demonstrated particularly empathy and positive regard or caring. Uh, the, the results on congruence were a little mixed. It's a harder uh, concept to measure and, uh, and because I think it's often found out that certain kinds of congruence are, are more helpful than others. And that, uh, but definitely when uh, the American Psychological Association did a major study on what works in counseling and psychotherapy, uh, I think they call it therapy, therapy relationships that work, they classified different qualities in the therapist or in the relationship as definitely effective or probably effective. And among the definitely and probably effective, definitely was, was empathy and probably effective, uh, unconditional positive regard. Uh, so as I say, there are numerous studies that show this when people do meta-analyses of putting a lot of studies together, what has the biggest effect on successful outcomes Time and again, Roger's initial insights about the importance of therapeutic relationship is confirmed and reaffirmed. So uh, that, was, that was a surprise. I had no idea that there was so much good research out there, which is ironic because still there is a tendency in the professions and in accrediting agencies and government actions to call certain approaches empirically supported, um, like cognitive behavioral, for example, there's a great deal of research on that approach shows, showing it's, it's uh, empirically supported, but they ignore the empirical support for the basic therapeutic relationship. Uh, it's to the point where uh, Robert Elliott, who uh, originally from, uh, I guess, he, well, he's worked in a number of places in Scotland and now in, in, the, uh, in Canada, um, has said that any training program for counselors or therapists that does not emphasize the creation of therapeutic relationships is unethical. In other words, there's so much research that shows how important it is that to not make that a major part of a training program would be ignoring uh, the, the, the cumulative knowledge of the profession. One uh, other professional surprise I got was that it related to Carl Rogers' role as a leader in the humanistic psychology movement in which he famously debated behaviorist B.F. Skinner on a number of occasions. And th this is well known that uh, Skinner, of course, being the leading figure on advocating the use of behavioral sciences to control human behavior. His, his famous book, Walden II, is, is, described a whole society based on operant conditioning, reinforcement, in which the best qualities we wanted in people would be nurtured through positive reinforcement and a whole society could be created that was productive and uh, happy and creative 
uh, according to Skinner's Walden II model. And Rogers was the humanist counterpoint to that, arguing about how careful we have to be in applying the behavioral sciences because the importance of maintaining people's choice was paramount, that, that freedom could be eroded when behavioral scientists could start to manipulate and control human behaviors as, as sort of as the advertising industry notably does. And Rogers became a leading voice after his uh, debates with B.F. Skinner in promulgating the, the uh, caution cautioning us to uh, resist the temptation and the tendency of, to have scientists control our behavior. Uh, very consistent with Roger's own professional philosophy of giving clients the freedom to choose their own directions. Well, that, that was all well known. Uh, but what I didn't realize is that during the same period that Rogers was advocating for the importance of limiting the role of the behavioral sciences, he was also working for the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency on projects that related to the control of human behavior. And trying to piece this together was very difficult for what was really going on. And some people were saying Rogers was a secret spy and was using his techniques to manipulate and control human beings. And Getting to the truth of it was very difficult because part of it is Rogers and others were bound by confidentiality agreements that he had signed with the CIA at the time in the 1950s and 60s and couldn't speak freely about it. So rumors would start to circulate and nothing much could be done with them. So, but to the best of our knowledge uh, in trying to learn as much as we could about this subject, it seems that indeed in the 1950s the uh, CIA funded a, an organization called the Society for the Investigation of Human Ecology, which was uh, to sponsor a number of research studies that the CIA was interested in. This was after the Korean War. And the U.S. was very worried about brainwashing techniques that the Koreans had utilized on captured American servicemen who would renounce their affiliation with the U.S. and say we were all wrong and would uh, provide great propaganda victories for the communists. And so the CIA wanted to understand more about techniques for questioning people, getting them to change their views and their attitudes. And they set up this front organization, which sponsored a lot of innocuous research like the, uh, like the effects of circumcision on Turkish boys. Uh, or other seemingly harmless uh, projects that, that were essentially to mislead and make it seem like a respectable research organization. But in fact, they were also uh, sponsoring some very nefarious kinds of studies like the effects of LSD and marijuana on trying to get people to tell the truth and, and the effects it would have on the psychology of college students who were given those drugs without their own, without knowledge. In other words, totally against even the looser ethical standards at the time for human subjects research. And so uh, Rogers became a board member of the Society for Human Ecology. And the question was, what did he know? I mean, why was he involved? And what were his projects and what did he know about it? Well, he, he he became involved because he was a patriotic American, basically. He had worked with the U.S. Armed Forces on a number of projects, like how to help return servicemen adjust to life back home after the Second World War, uh, kind of get over some of their, they didn't call it PTSD at the time, but get over some of their stress and reintegrate in life back home. Uh, he was involved with the studies for how to uh, use non-directive techniques, uh, questioning techniques by uh, service workers to survey American public opinion. Instead of just asking yes, no questions, the people would, would reflect back to the client what, they, what the survey recipient so that get them to express more of their views. And uh, so Rogers had worked with the US Army on, on a number of occasions. And 
This was, at, back at the time, the Central Intelligence Agency, which later became as America's role in the Vietnam War and, and some of the projects that the CIA was involved in, uh, in terms of assassinations of foreign leaders, made the CIA suspect among many, many parts of American society and, and worldwide. Um, at the time, the CIA were the good guys. They were trying to fight the, R the Russians who were at the beginning of the Cold War were saying, we want to take over the world. And so Rogers, as a patriotic American, got involved, allowed his name to be used beyond the board of directors. He also got some funding for his own research. But the research that he got funding from them for was part of his work on applying the person-centered approach with schizophrenics in, in, a, in the hospital settings. And he used the funding for good ethical scientific research. In fact, when one of his coworkers was asked to use a, a truth serum with one of his patients, he was providing counseling to the person with schizophrenia, but somebody else in the hospital was giving them uh, sodium pentothal. Uh, he, Rogers really objected to it. He said, after she got sodium pentothal, she would say things and then regret them and then feel guilty about what she said. And he didn't want to have anything to do with patients who had been given sodium pentothal. He, he felt that was not a helpful thing to do with human beings uh, uh, who are undergoing therapy. So he has always remained ethical in his own research. How much he knew about the other projects going on that were not so, so benign, uh, we don't know for certain, uh, simply can't, haven't been able to reconstruct it. But the irony is that after all this, this over these years, we, we, knew, we knew how much Rogers had become the champion among humanist psychologists for cautioning the world about the dangers of using behavioral sciences with human beings. Uh, we didn't know that Rogers had been involved and maybe he had insights about the dangers that he couldn't speak of directly, but indirectly he was, he was putting what he had learned by being involved with the CIA, uh, he was putting it into practice by cautioning us and opposing Skinner's worldview. Uh, so this was, this was fascinating to learn about. And, and so those are four of the surprises I had that related to Carl Rogers' work. Also had just as big surprises, if not bigger ones, related to his life. Because in some ways, Rogers, more than most psychologists, seemed like an open book. He seemed to practice congruence. The quality he talked about in therapeutic relationships, of being real, of dropping facades, of being honest, of self-disclosing. And he did it in charming ways. If any of you have ever read some of Roger's personal writings, like uh, his chapter, This Is Me, from his book on becoming a person, or things he wrote about his marriage, uh, he seemed very open and endearing and built trust in the readers and, and a personal connection, uh, more than most professional writers do. So it was a surprise to find the many areas that Rogers did not, either did not talk about or while he didn't necessarily lie about in his personal writings, he only told a small part of the story and allowed the reader to read into it what the reader wanted to read and, and did not fully appreciate uh, what was really happening in Rogers' life. And there are three areas that I would mention in this. One is his relationships with women. Second is his relationship with alcohol. And third is his relationship with the universe, with his spiritual life. Um, Rogers was married to Helen Elliot Rogers for 51 years. Uh, maybe by the time she died, 57 years. Um, and for virtually the first 54 years of that marriage, was completely monogamous. And those who knew Carl and Helen Rogers looked at them as a, a model couple, old-fashioned, but wonderful 
genuine people, caring, giving, good relationship, great relationship with their children. And yet, while that was true for much of their relationship, what was not known um, was that during the last years of their marriage, they ran into a period of real turmoil. Helen was getting ill, and her world was closing in. Carl continued to learn and grow throughout his life, professionally and personally. He was always working on becoming. He was always challenging himself. And here he was in the 1960s in California, the center of the encounter group movement, where people were coming together in these small, intense learning groups, personal development workshops, and opening up and sharing more of themselves and exploring positive and negative feelings in this small group context. And naturally, aside from whatever benefits the experience might have in general, it was the occasion for greater intimacy among the men and women in these small groups. And this was the time of the sexual revolution and open marriage, uh, the book Open Marriage that was advocating couples not necessarily be monogamous but have more than one loving, open relationship. Uh, this was on the top of the bestseller list in, in the US. And um, this was the, a lot of uh, experimentation going on in lifestyles. And Rogers was in the middle of all that, this conservative Midwesterner married for 50 years, faithful the whole time. And that might have continued that way, but as Helen became ill and as he needed, wanted to, she wanted him to stay home more, he wanted to go out and do his workshops and do his work, tried to balance it, tension began, again, came in the marriage. And he also, they, she was no longer interested in a sexual relationship. He, in his 60s and 70s, still felt virile and alive and interested in uh, intimacy and exploring the boundaries of human relationships. Eventually, a few years before her death, he started becoming interested in having other relationships and even taking it to the, the sexual level. But he didn't do much with it. He was, he was shy. He didn't know, he wasn't skillful, he wasn't smooth, he wasn't a Hollywood handsome figure. Um, but eventually he had a few relationships. And the dilemma was, what does he do about it? Does he do it quietly, secretively, not tell Helen, hide it? Or does he try to deal with it? Does he talk to her about it? Does he, does he, does he say he wants to have more of a relationship with Helen? Um, he wants to, or to understand his feelings. Well, he was caught in the middle of, if he, in a way it would be caring for her not to talk about it, to just do it, or it would be even more caring not to do it. Um, but he, was, he wanted to grow. He didn't want to feel like his life was over. Plus, plus he had a feeling of, he was starting to experience what we would call ED today, erectile dysfunction. And he felt he didn't have, he didn't have much time left. He, in, in one article he wrote he, in, that, that I, ha, I probably only have a few orgasms left in my life. And not article, uh, in a private diary entry. Um, so what does a person do in that dilemma? I mean, and in some ways, it's a dilemma of the human condition uh, for all of us. Uh, when, when is it more kind and honest not to be honest, uh, more kind not to be honest uh, than, than to be disclosing? Uh, when, when do we sacrifice our own needs for someone else? I mean, she, she had sacrificed a lot throughout her life for, for his, the benefit of his career and, and their children. Uh, did he not owe her a duty of loyalty at this time? Um, but wh when does sacrificing oneself for someone else not a healthy thing? And, uh, and so how do, how do we judge this, this period of Rogers? 
Uh, I asked many, many people who knew him and Helen, uh, including their children, what they felt about it. And his closest colleagues and family were absolutely divided on it. Some said he owed her that gift of loyalty that she had given him. Um, and others said no, including his daughter Natalie, Natalie, who knew them both very well, cared for them both during this period. She felt her mother was responsible too, her mother was a free agent, that, um, that there was no villain uh, or, or hero in this, that they were both caught in a, in a very unhappy situation, they were both responsible, um, they, were, they were trying the best they could, and uh, so in, in some ways we project our own moral judgments as to, uh, on the situation, as to what we believe was, was Rogers acting as a model of the person-centered approach, being willing to grow, being willing to change, wanting to communicate openly and honestly about it, wanting to make each relationship as positive and uh, realize its potential as much as possible, or was he being selfish and, and represented some of the extremes of the human potential movement uh, that was more concerned with self-actualization than with one's social responsibilities. So in some ways his experience uh, is, is not simply a personal story but uh, kind of a symbolic of a dilemma of the times and in some ways of the human condition. Um, I, I should answer that, I should add just as a uh, epilogue to that, after Helen died, uh, when Rogers was uh, um, 77 at the time, then of course that dilemma went away and nobody would judge him harshly for having relationships with others and he took full advantage of that. He had uh, loving, sexually active relationships with three women simultaneously for about seven years um, and each knew of the other's uh, involvement and accepted it more or less on those terms and it continued to be a rich uh, source of his own life and growth and understanding about personal relationships. I was surprised by that whole, I, did, I had no idea that was going on behind, behind the scenes. Uh, and the sad thing is that while that was happening, while Rogers in his journal, was private journal, was writing about in a little entry on balancing uh, human rela balancing relationships and talking about how he had had over the previous two month period he had had visits of ten to fourteen days from each of his three partners. At the same time, a few days later, he was writing about how lonely he was, how meaningless his life sometimes felt, and how, in a sense, despairing he felt. Now, how could that be? What, what was going on? Well, it turned out Rogers had a problem with alcohol. He, um, he started uh, early in his life again. He came from a family, a, a religious fundamentalist family, that, where alcohol was forbidden. It w didn't play much a part in his life, but as he became an, an adult, he would have the social drink, the cocktail. Um, he and Helen would entertain, serve drinks to, to their friends, enjoy in themselves, nothing unusual. But as they got to middle age and older, they both started to drink more than the, the norm. Uh, it helped him relax in his writing. He wrote more fluidly. Um, as, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or so it, so it seemed, so it felt. Um, he, uh, he, it helped, uh, as, as she began to have physical illnesses, it, it, she would drink uh, some to help uh, distract, as sort of as a self-medication uh, for some of the pain. Um, as he got older, he had difficulty sleeping, and he, he thought his drinking was helping him sleep, but in, in fact it would then, a few hours later, he would awake and have difficulty sleeping again. 
And gradually, he started, they started to drink more. And it, uh, it, it got to the point where it was fairly serious. Um, and it was, the, the irony is, uh, so when he would go on a trip, for example, they, they would, they would, he would often need to, as a first stop after getting off the airplane, he would need to go to the liquor store and buy a couple of bottles of vodka. And it, uh, the, the amazing thing, though, is that it never seemed to affect his work. When he was with people during the day, he was none of his colleagues said, I never saw him act inappropriately, never saw him drunk, never saw him uh, in any way impaired in his work and in his personal relationships throughout the normal day. It was at night when he would do most of his drinking, have difficulty sleeping, when the world started to seem a, a, not such an optimistic, hopeful place to him. When he would brood, when he would, his, he, he had, ang had anxiety. Um, he always had anxiety about being late, about, uh, uh, he was always shy. Um, this, would, this would get worse when, when he was drinking. And so he was what you would call, uh, he, he, in a, he was self-medicating with alcohol. Um, he was dependent on it. And occasionally he acknowledged it and often denied it. Uh, basically sort of saying that I can stop, it's not so bad, um, I'm still functioning effectively. And that was all true. So it was a rather sad situation where, in a sense, he was a closet drinker. Um, hardly anyone who knew him knew about it. His, his children did, and, and in his later years confronted him and said, you've, you've got to get help for this. You've got to stop it. Um, but his closest colleagues were simply unaware of it. And as his biographer, I was unaware of it. Uh, but in his journals and in some of the letters that I had access to from his family where they really laid it all out, that described his symptoms and, and how harmful it was being for him, um, it, it was very clear that he had an alcohol dependence. And so it was almost like there were two Carl Rogerses, that, that in his normal everyday activity, he was just as congruent, and as, as he wrote about, he, you saw, what you saw was, was who he was. He was genuinely a caring person, uh, an open person, uh, an admirable role model in terms of an older adult in his 70s and 80s who was taking on new experiences and challenges and growing and being a real representative of the human potential movement. Um, and the other Carl Rogers was this person in his private life who was suffering, who in his psyche and in his soul was suffering. Um, and uh, of course, he was one person and in a sense represented in, an in a rather extreme case uh, what's true of all of us. We, are, we do have our contradictions, all of us. Um, uh, but his were writ large, although not visible. Let me check time to see if there's time for one more surprise or if it's time for me to sum up. I, I forgot. Ten. We're good? Good. So while these phenomena in his private life were going on, the, the, these conflicts, he was also becoming interested in the spiritual world. Uh, again, in ways that he did not write about or speak about very much. He, he only hinted at. And it's not surprising in a way that at, both as he was getting older, closer to death, um, he would, his thoughts might turn to matters of the, of the spirit and the, the, the bigger universe. Um, but it, also the fact that he was going through these personal development issues uh, and difficulties in his, in his personal life 
could also motivate uh, his interest in the spirit as a, as a solution, as a way to try to come to accept himself and, uh, in, a different, in a different level. So uh, Rogers, growing up in a conservative Midwestern religious family, uh, came to reject religion. He, he was going to become a minister when he was younger, uh, studied for the ministry, went to theological seminary, started practicing uh, in his summer internships in, in, in a church. But eventually, when he got involved with psychology, just as his parents feared by going to that liberal union theological seminary in New York City instead of the uh, conservative Princeton Theological Seminary in, in uh, New Jersey, uh, just as they feared, he, he became an atheist. And he totally rejected religion, didn't want to have anything to do with it when his students or colleagues would try to talk about the relationship of client-centered therapy to religion. He just didn't, he was not interested. He, they, they quickly learned, don't bring it up around him. Uh, yet later in his life, uh, he became <coughs> immersed again in the California culture of the 70s which was and 80s, which was all about the rediscovery of Eastern religion, of meditation, of, uh, of um, later on it would be mindfulness, of um, gurus, uh, Swami Muktananda and uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yoga, that was capturing the imagination of the West uh, that maybe uh, those of us involved in, in Western philosophy and Western religion uh, were missing something, some, some wisdom of the East, and, and uh, all across the Western world, and particularly in California, uh, there was a great deal of interest, and among Roger's young colleagues at the Center for Studies of the Person where he worked, um, there was great interest, in, and, and simultaneously there was a great amount of drug taking, and whether from marijuana to LSD, where people were reporting a, a new understanding of the universe uh, resulting from their drug experiences. And Rogers is in the middle of all this, not interested in drugs, never, never even experimented with marijuana, as far as I can tell. Um, and yet, something started happening in his personal life that caused him to become interested in this topic. Uh, among them was Helen's death when uh, she reported uh, having certain visions and experiences that um, seemed to him profoundly interesting uh, when their friends started inviting psychics over to, to their house and, and to their center to where he participated in various demonstrations of psychic phenomena uh, such as uh, a, uh, a painter named Gasparetto, a, a psychic channeler who, with the lights out, in 20 minutes could produce 20 different drawings characteristic of the, the masters, Matisse and Picasso and Monet and so on, and, and uh, you know, basically with his eyes closed, reproduce these drawings as they're channeling those masters. And even Helen, who was an artist herself, thought it was truly amazing that uh, he began to have, and they had psychic readings after Helen died and before she died where the medium seemed to have access to facts that they could not possibly have known, that Roger started to feel maybe there's something to this and, and became interested, and especially after Helen's death, we had a sort of a yearning to see if, if there was a way she, they could still communicate, and uh, that he seemed to be very open to learning about this. And the people who knew him, I asked their opinions on it. And again, they were divided right down the middle on whether he, as one person said, fell for it hook, line, and sinker, or as another person said, remained the skeptic to the end. Uh, I tend to think he, was, he, he maintained his scientific objectivity. And uh, he, he, he always, looked for other explanations, counter hypotheses, and, uh, but it was a fascinating period in which he came to develop a, uh, what he called a formative tendency, a new part of his theory that just as human beings 
were evolving and developing uh, more uh, higher consciousness that um, in terms of human potential, so is the universe developing and unfolding in positive ways. Um, so, so he added some very interesting and I think important parts to his own philosophical and, and professional views uh, by his experiences with the paranormal and with spirituality. So I'm left with these surprises, these personal surprises, asking myself, does it change my view of Carl Rogers? And in some ways, these surprises did change my view. Uh, I, I felt after writing the second biography that his work was even more important than after writing the first one. Important for us as professionals in terms of demonstrating the value of the therapeutic relationship, the insights from the person-centered approach that, that the therapeutic relationship itself is healing. It's not just the foundation by which you can then start doing real therapy. It is real therapy, forming that relationship and maintaining that relationship. Other methods can enhance it, I believe, but the importance of Roger's work, I think, has been validated again and again uh, in the subsequent decades. It's also important in terms of recognizing how we, as individual therapists, have skills that we can use to heal communities close to us and around the world. That, that's a powerful insight, I think, that, that I don't know that it can be said about any other approach to psychotherapy. On the other hand, no, it doesn't change my uh, view of Rogers. Even with all I learned about his difficulties with his, re his personal relationships uh, I mean, and with alcohol, he did not end up being a tragic hero in my mind, a great person, a great man brought down by a tragic flaw or two. Uh, no, I think he was just a human being, uh, struggling, and in some ways I think he was more courageous than I ever would have thought of him, realizing what he was struggling with, how he still managed to be the caring, effective, professional, and person that he was in virtually all his relationships. It's remarkable given what he was struggling with. So in the end, uh, writing the life and work of Carl Rogers was for me uh, an experience that not only deepened my understanding of him, but I think it helped deepen my understanding of myself and my own contradictions and of help my understanding of the human condition. And I hope that uh, sharing this with you, um, you might have resonated with some of the, both the personal and professional struggles and victories that, that Rogers had over the course of his career. Thank you.